Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming here today uh, to a technical deep dive into our Unity Catalogs Practitioner Playbook. I know that this is right after one of our keynotes, and it's uh, a lot of sitting for one day. So thank you for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. So a uh, quick product safe harbor statement. Um, everything that we kind of talk about, in, in, uh, for the most part, from a, from a preview perspective, is basically general product direction. And it's intended for informational purposes. Uh, you should make your purchase decisions basically on the services that we have on the truck. All right, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Zeeshan Papa. I have 22 years of experience. Um, I have six years of experience building with Databricks and 10 years of experience building scalable data platforms. So there's about four years of experience there where I suffered abject pain and you know, suffering for, you know, a lot of, uh, <laughs> for a lot of you who've actually built data platforms uh, from the ground up, you, you know how hard it can be. Today, I am a product leader. I work across our field teams and product management. Uh, for those of you that are watching this via live stream, I have a little bit less hair than my photo would tell you, and I'm constantly bothering my co-host, Ify. Thanks, Zishan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ify Derek Lee. I've been working with uh, big data technologies for over 13 years, the last three with Databricks. In the, the last six years, I've been focusing specifically on security and governance. Um, and uh, my superpower is being very patient with Zishan and also being able to keep up with his crazy speed of thought. And if you don't get that joke, by the end of the talk, you will probably understand it. Thank you, Effie. All right, so from an agenda perspective, uh, we're going to start by talking a bit about Unity Catalog and how it relates to cloud providers, so guys like AWS, Azure, GCP, what are the constructs that exist within Unity? How are they managed uh, and, and correlate to your cloud constructs? We're then going to talk a little bit about registering data with Unity Catalog. Uh, so database sources, as you heard, Query Federation, file sources, how does all that work? We're going to talk about securing your data. What are some of the features and capabilities that you have there? If he's going to talk a little bit about discovering data with search and lineage capabilities, we'll, we'll touch on auditing, specifically things like billing tables, uh, who accessed what, like who can, who, how much did a particular user spend on a particular job or a particular query. Uh, then we'll talk about how Unity Catalog opens up the door to open data sharing, powered by Delta sharing. We'll speak a little bit about the upgrade process to Unity Catalog. How do you kind of go from A to B? I'm working with Hive, and I've got these different systems. How do I start using Unity Catalog today? We'll discuss a little bit about architecture patterns, and then we have a demo that if we will run through, and then we have a surprise guest that we'll introduce towards the end of this presentation. All right, so Unity Catalog, right? We've been hearing about it probably for, what, a year or two years now. Uh, what is it really, right? Uh, I'm sure some of you have a pretty good idea of what Unity is, but I'd like to level set, right? It's this unified governance and, uh, uh, layer for data and AI within the Lakehouse platform, specifically the ability to provide unified visibility into data and AI, a single permission model for data and AI, so like not, not having to worry about permissioning across multiple or different systems. AI-powered monitoring and observability, and as I mentioned before, open data sharing. So this takes a few different uh, shapes or feature buckets across the spectrum with Unity Catalog. Specifically, there are features around access controls, ensuring who has access to what data. There are features around lineage, specifically understanding how a table came to be, how a table is being used. Also, we've improved the search features within uh, Unity Catalog, within Databricks, by uh, providing a much better search experience than what existed before which is super important because as you start to think about uh, the governance lens, right, it's not just about controlling access to data, it's also about making data available. From a monitoring perspective, you've heard great things from Casey on our keynote, uh, I believe two days ago, speaking specifically about all of the lake house monitoring aspects, so the ability to kind of create monitors on tables and on machine learning models to understand things like time series uh, changes over time, like metrics over time, or inference uh, changes over time. Pretty incredible and powerful. Also, from an auditing perspective, all of the audit information in one place, powered by system tables, if you will touch on that a little bit later. Um, and then, as, I, as I, again, just sharing. But all of this, all of these different feature buckets, right, are possible because we've brought everything to the center, everything to Unity Catalog, all of that metadata on files, on tables, on machine learning models, notebooks, dashboards, et cetera, it all lives in one place. And if it lives in one place, it gives us the ability to kind of accelerate our features and our feature growth and provide this you know, unified governance layer that we have aspired to build. <clears throat> so if you think about that, 
you have all these different workload types. You've got BI, data warehousing, you've got data engineering, you have data streaming, data science, or ML. You have these different compute platforms on the other side of this beautiful diagram, right? You've got uh, you know, Amazon Athena, you've got Presto, EMR, Spark, Trino, whatever it is, right? How do these things connect and, and work with Unity Catalog? So hopefully you've heard about our announcements as far as Hive Metastore compatibility layers are. So all these external legacy compute platforms, they can actually connect directly to Unity Catalog via that layer. Things like Amazon Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery, MySQL, so on and so forth, we have the ability to federate those catalogs into Unity. We have the ability to access what's in your legacy hive. We have the ability to go directly to cloud storage and query data that lives in your, in your data lake as well. So there's a lot of that all together that builds this entire picture. And the beautiful part here is that we're providing governance on all of this. So switching gears, I want to talk about something that I think is very important. And I think I call it the spectrum of organizational governance. And I work with a ton of companies uh, over many years in terms of understanding how they approach governance, how they approach production of assets. And the reality is, is that it's often a spectrum. Right? On the left-hand side, you have this centralized spectrum, right, where the production of data artifacts are managed by a central team. One team produces it. This is very common. I, I see this in, in really high-tech companies very often where uh, they have you know, one data team, and that one data team is responsible for taking everything from the app or the feature team uh, that owns the primary product. Um, the same, similarly, governance policies are often implied and enforced by those central teams in centralized governance models. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, you might have domain-driven production of data artifacts. Now, this is very common in large enterprises. Every uh, individual domain owns a production of their artifacts. Now, possibly, they also own the entitlements uh, on those, so the domain teams might also own those entitlements. But more often than not, you're kind of somewhere in the middle. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You might have some assets that are produced by central teams. You might have some assets that are produced by domain teams. And you might have some variance in terms of how access is granted to the variety of resources in your data estate. So this is a kind of a foundational piece, if he is going to touch on this as we start to talk about Unity Catalog and cloud providers. Thank you, Zishan. So we'll start our deeper dive here, because it's important to understand how UC correlates to the cloud providers. And we're going to look at this picture in the three cloud providers. We'll start with Azure. The, the red boxes are Databricks components, and the gray boxes are the, the cloud provider um, components. When we start using Databricks in Azure, typically we spin up a workspace if we're contributors and, and have access to do that within our subscription, and we create a workspace. Now, all the workspaces that we create within the same Azure Active Directory tenant will report back to a single Databricks account. So the Databricks account correlates to the Azure Active Directory tenant. Within those subscriptions, we'll have workspaces those workspaces connect to the same Databricks account. In AWS, when we start using Databricks, the first thing we do is create a Databricks account, and we connect it to an AWS account. Now, uh, we can also connect multiple AWS accounts to that single Databricks account, and then every workspace that we create will connect again to that one account. And you know, the reason why these things happen, you may have an AWS account for uh, dev, for example. You may have a separate one for prod, and you want to separate your workspaces that way. So that's why you may have multiple AWS accounts. Again, they all connect to that single Databricks account. In Google Cloud, we, um, our, our entry point is through the GCP marketplace. So you create a Databricks account through the marketplace, and then within Google, uh, there's different entitlements, there's different projects where you organize your infrastructure. And so you'll have potentially a dev project and a prod project. Within those projects, you're going to deploy your workspaces. Again, the workspaces connect to the Databricks account. So this is important to understand because when we talk about Unity Catalog, it is a Databricks account level service. So it, it, it kind of sits in that level. When we start using Unity Catalog, the first thing we do is we create a meta store. And the meta store correlates to a region. So for example, if you're deployed in, let's say, AWS in US East 1 and US West 2, you're going to have two meta stores, one for US East 1, one for US West 2. Now, within meta stores, we create catalogs. And I want to differentiate here. So the service is called Unity Catalog. We'll refer to it as Unity Catalog, as UC, as Unity, right? That's the top-level service. 
But there's also the, the concept of a catalog, which is a collection of schemas within a Metastore. Okay, so I just want to make sure those terms are, are clear. So a catalog is a little bit of a gray area. So at the minimum, you'll probably have a catalog corresponding to an account or a subscription or a project. But you may also have multiple catalogs for different reasons. So for different business units, you may have different catalogs. You may bring in foreign catalogs, marketplace catalogs. It's pretty flexible how you want to design um, and, and organize your data within catalogs. Storage location is another important concept within UC. It corresponds to object store. So it will be your S3 bucket, your ADLS account, or your GCS bucket. And lastly, we have the credentials. The, the, the credential is how you can access the storage location, and that corresponds to an IM role or managed identity or service account, respectively. Okay, and why do we need to understand all that? Because it also correlates with how we assign the different roles that we have in Unity Catalog and, and use Unity Catalog overall. The first thing I want to highlight about roles it is best practice to assign roles to groups, right? You don't want to have a single individual that is your account admin, and they go on vacation or they quit, and all of a sudden you have no way to log into your account console, right? So make sure you assign them to groups, and then you can manage membership within your Active Directory. Okay, so first role that's very important is the account admin. And the account admin is a pretty privileged role, right? It's at that account level, so obviously uh, it's a pretty top level layer. They can create and configure the meta stores. They can create and manage users, groups, service principles, and also create credentials. Now, because it's a pretty privileged role, typically this will be assigned to some sort of central platform operations or central governance team. When the account admin creates a Metastore, they can assign a Metastore admin. And the Metastore admin can now manage everything that happens within the Metastore. So they can create catalogs within that Metastore, they can create external locations, shares, um, and they can change ownership of the securables within that Metastore. So again, pretty privileged role. So typically it will be some sort of platform operations or, or central governance team that owns this as well. Now, as we create the different secure pools, like catalogs and schemas, a lot of times we want to delegate data ownership to other groups that are more familiar with how that data should be um, secured and accessed. And that's where the data owner comes into play. So we may have a data owner for a catalog, for example, or a schema. They can grant access and control privileges of what exists within that catalog or uh, schema. And this will vary. It might be some central team, or it might be some distributed business user governance team that has this role. And then lastly, we have the workspace admin, which you probably are all familiar from the past because um, that's the admin that controls the workspace, right? And it's more related to the compute rather than the data. So they control clusters, who has access to clusters, who can create them or not, uh, workflows, notebooks, and so on. Now, with, in a Unity Catalog environment, the workspace admin is recommended and should change ownership of jobs, production jobs, to service principles. Um, and now, because they have the capacity to do that and use service principles, they have potentially the ability to look at data. So we want to make sure that there is regular service principle audits in place in our workspaces. Okay, now tying it back to what Zishan was talking about earlier about the spectrum of organizational governance, depending on where you are in that spectrum, how you manage your meta stores, your catalogs, and assign these roles will be dictated by your organizational pattern. So if you're in more of that you know, centralized side, you're going to have probably some you know, central subscriptions or accounts or projects for your uh, cloud infrastructure. You're going to have a central team that manages all that, that manages maybe production of data and governance and access. So respectively, with Unity Catalog and Databricks, you're going to have that central team that creates and manages your credentials, your external locations, your meta stores, your catalogs, and potentially even your production pipelines. If you're more towards the distributed uh, side of the spectrum, Perhaps every business group, business unit, has their own subscription or account where they uh, do their compute. Maybe they have their own storage accounts um, or buckets 
for data isolation, for cost allocation, all sorts of reasons. And so, and then they own their own pipelines, their own data. So if you're in that side of the spectrum, you probably have distributed teams as well that manage their own catalogs, their own workspaces, their own production jobs. And of course, as Dishan said, you can be somewhere in the middle, right, and kind of use a little bit of both. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is a direct correlation of how Unity Catalog relates to cloud um, concepts, public cloud concepts, and how you organize your governance within your company will dictate how you organize your meta stores, your catalogs, and the privileges within UC. And I'll pass it back to Zisha. Awesome. Thanks, Ify. Uh, so building on that, we're going to talk about uh, how to register data with Unity Catalog. So to start with, uh, hopefully you guys heard some of our announcements at the keynote. But if you didn't, uh, I still want to talk a little bit about Query Federation. Query Federation uh, is a feature that gives us the ability to provide a single point to secure all access for our data. So if I have data that lives in databases, for example, my SQL, SQL Server, Snowflake, what, it, what, what, what have it be, I'm able to take that database, that, all the data that's in that database, and register it as a catalog within Unity Catalog. We call that a foreign catalog. And what that means is that I can now query that data right alongside data that lives in my data lake. How cool is that? I don't have to worry about ETLing the data in uh, necessarily uh, if I want to, for example, like bring in a reference data table that lives in some obscure uh, metadata management tool somewhere. I can just federate it in and query it alongside the rest of my data. This is extremely powerful when you start to think about more than just querying, also governing and cataloging that data without having to necessarily ingest it. And this, this, is, this feature gives us the ability to have the unified permissions controls that live on top of Unity, so things like role-level uh, role uh, security, column-level masking, et cetera. Uh, it also gives us the ability to take predicates that we might have within our query in Databricks and push it down to the downstream uh, data source. So for example, if I'm reading from a table that lives in MySQL and I have a where clause on that uh, query or some, some kind of limiting factor on that query, that predicate evaluation occurs on the database system. It doesn't occur within Databricks. So you don't have to go grab the entirety of that table and bring it back. You just have to get the data that you need. So if you think about things like change data capture type use cases, this is extremely powerful. In addition to that, we also have the, way, uh, the ability to accelerate query performance with a feature that we have called materialized views. Um, at the present moment, we support read-only operations. Um, I'll talk a little, bit of, a little bit more about some of the fundamentals around Query Federation as we continue. But just to, to keep it in mind, this is giving you the ability to unify the disparate data estate that you have in your organization with the lake house. So I want to land a few fundamental concepts uh, specifically for file-based data sources and also for working with databases. So specifically, the first thing on the file-based uh, side, if he has talked about before, is a credential object. Now, a credential object is an abstraction on a cloud provider security uh, uh, fundamental, like, for example, a managed identity uh, service account in GCP or an IAM role in AWS. This is a way to manage that as a first-party resource within Unity Catalog. So you create it in your cloud provider, you register it in Unity Catalog. Those credentials can be used to build what are called external locations. External locations are just storage locations for things like external tables, external volumes, arbitrary files. You can actually take an external location and turn it into what is called a managed data source. And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But effectively, you, do, you create a credential, you use that credential to create an external location, and now you can start interacting with storage. Manage and external tables, which we'll dive into also in a further slide, are ways in which you can store tabular data. Um, those uh, tabular data can live in either managed or external locations. And I spoke a bit about how an external location can become a managed uh, data source. And then manage and external volumes are ways to interact with arbitrary files right inside those same locations. So you think about the, the plethora of file-based data sources. I've got tabular, non-tabular assets. I can work with them with these abstractions and govern them in secure ways. On the right-hand side, we've got databases. Now, the connection object is more or less exactly what you think it is, right? It's an abstraction to basically encapsulate authentication and connection information to allow you to connect to an external database. And that, uh, that is a, you know, a MySQL, Snowflake, so on and so forth. Once that connection has been established, you can then register that connection uh, as a for with a foreign catalog. And that foreign catalog can represent the entirety of that database in UC. And as I mentioned, you can query it alongside your managed data sources and other file sources. All right, switching gears here. Let's get a little technical. Querying file-based sources with Unity. An administrator creates an IAM role, uh, managed identity, service account, depending on what cloud they're in. 
They create the storage credentials to map that account to Unity Catalog. They create the external locations in Unity Catalog. Perhaps they register managed data sources. They register tables. They define access policies on that data in Unity Catalog. The user runs a query. It's a SQL query, Python, R, Scala. They send that query to a cluster, to a, a SQL warehouse, a serverless SQL warehouse. That endpoint will check the namespace, the metadata, and the grants of that object by making a call out to Unity Catalog, which is a control plane service. Unity Catalog will say, hey, let me run a permission evaluation on you. Are you who you say you are? Are you uh, uh, able to access this particular data set or data sets in your operation? And based on that pass or fail, it'll write it out to the audit log. After that, assuming it's a pass, it'll assume the underlying IAM role, managed identity, or service account for that underlying object that that user is trying to read. It'll go to that cloud storage device, S3 ADLS, GC, GC, uh, GCS, and it will, depending on the cloud, either return a uh, list of data files, like with you know, scope down temporary tokens or pre-signed URLs, back to that cluster or that warehouse, which then now has access to go and read that data. Now, I'll pause for a second on step five, because it's important to note that Unity is in the request path, but not in the path of data. So when that cluster or that warehouse wants to query the data, the bulk of that operation all of the, uh, the, the, e uh, uh, the charge to go get the um, data from cloud storage is occurring from that cluster, that warehouse, in, in your VPC directly to cloud storage. Now, once that's occurred, the data comes back to that cloud, uh, to, your, to your cluster, or to your warehouse. There's perhaps additional policies that might have to be enforced. So think about Parquet or Delta Lake or Avro or any other uh, big data file format. Things are stored in row column groupings. They're in partition files. You don't have uh, any way to get to fine-grained security by just saying, I can read a file or not read a file. That file might contain more rows or more columns than I, I need to have. So what we do is, at the last mile there on the cluster of the warehouse, we, f we enforce the policies uh, that are specific for the user that is making that query. And then that data is then sent back to the user. So this whole circle right, is how we uh, manage and uh, work with file-based data sources with Unity Catalog. For database sources with, with uh, Unity Catalog, it's somewhat similar, right? Your admin defines JDBC connection information uh, and, and uh, you know, has that uh, information that they've, that they've been given from perhaps the database administrator. They register that as a connection object inside Unity Catalog. They register the foreign catalog. Now that foreign catalog is accessible within Unity. They define access policies on that. Your user goes and queries that data. Again, SQL, Python, R, Scala. They hit that cluster, that warehouse, that serverless warehouse. They check the, the Unity uh, will check the namespace, metadata, and grants of that object, provide some policy enforcement at, at that point uh, before Unity provides back encrypted credential information to that cluster or that warehouse so that it can go and directly grab the data from the JDBC database and then return it to the user. So it's a similar pattern. Uh, policy enforcement is happening a little bit further up the chain. What also happens as part of this is every time you run a query, any metadata changes that occurred in the source system are automatically pushed to the UC control plane. So not terribly dissimilar from how it works with file-based sources, but it's a great pattern, and it works exceedingly well for a lot of customers that have started using Query Federation, so very exciting stuff. Now, what this gives you is, like, for me, uh, as a former data engineer, amazing, right? It gives you a governed namespace across file and database sources. It gives you the ability to access your legacy Metastore and your foreign databases all powered by Query Federation. So for example, on the left-hand side of this diagram, you've got your legacy Hive Metastore. Now that could be the legacy Hive Metastore that perhaps shipped initially with your Databricks workspace. It could be an external Metastore that you manage as part of your, uh, your organization. The Unity Catalog, when querying a, uh, data via Unity Catalog, you have the ability to access that legacy Metastore. As I mentioned, you also have the ability to access your foreign catalogs, whatever you choose to register. And you have the ability to access all of the data that's formally registered within Unity Catalog. And that includes uh, views, that includes models, functions, uh, things that live inside arbitrary file containers, and as I mentioned, manage and external tables. So the beauty of this, ultimately, right, is that you can kind of bring everything together. So I want to talk a little bit about managed data sources uh, and what they really mean. So by default, when you create a Metastore, you have a managed container or bucket that's associated with that Metastore. Now, that effectively means that if I created a table without a, with external location or with, without a specified external location for that table, uh, that this would be the default place for that uh, 
table would live effectively. And Unity will manage the path for you. That's effectively what a managed uh, table means. Unity manages the path. Uh, you specify at a hierarchical level where that path or where that, where that uh, uh, table would, would be stored. And by default, it's the meta store. Optionally, however, you also can uh, specify it at the catalog. So for example, I could specify a managed data source uh, for a particular catalog such that anytime I create a table in that catalog, by default, it will be stored in that catalog's managed data source. This is great when you start to think about data isolation, cost allocation for different domains. You might want to have one domain that has uh, default buckets that they can store their data in and another domain that can have default buckets that they can store they their data in. This is super easy with Unity Catalog. You can use these uh, primitive uh, resources that we have on catalogs and also, alternatively, on schemas. So depending on where you might separate costs or uh, the level of granularity that you might need to get to, you might need to also optionally do it at the schema. So again, similarly with the schema, I can specify a managed data source to be the default for that schema such that when I create a table without a uh, you know, external location specified, that that is a default storage device. It's interesting to note that with Unity Catalog, you have different ACL trees between your external locations that you define and your external table. So what does that mean? So in the previous slide, we talked about managed data sources, right? I'm, for example, specify, not specifying a uh, location for every table that I create. I'm specifying a location at the schema, the catalog, or the metastore level. With Unity Catalog, you can also obviously register external tables. So that is any table that has a predefined path or a, a particular path that you want to store it at. Now, it's interesting to note that when I do that, that table has its own ACL tree. It's completely separate from the actual storage device, right? So for example, I might have the ability to read and write on a particular external location or volumes that are in that external location, but if I'm not granted specifically read-write access or modify access to the table that lives in that external location, I will not be able to write to it. So important to note, uh, you can have you know, users that have access to uh, some part of an external location through volumes or directly on the external location itself, and you can keep that separate from the tables that are registered there. So a little bit about volumes. So I'm super excited about volumes, um, and for, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but volumes give you, give you the ability to access, to store, to organize, and process files with Unity Catalog governance. So for example, I might have unstructured data, things like images or audio, video, PDF files that I might use to train ML, or I might have semi-structured data, validation, test data sets, things like that, that I might use to also train my models. I might also have things like raw data files that I'm using just to explore and see, like, what is this data? Like, how do I, how can I make sense of this? I don't want to register that in a table, right? I want to use that in a file system. I might have things like library config files, operational data that I want to write out, like checkpoint files. This is what volumes are used for, non-tabular data sets. Volumes are created under managed or external locations, and they will show up in UC Lineage. So for example, if I create a pipeline from a particular volume, and that pipeline goes and creates a table, I will know by looking at the lineage of that table or that volume what, uh, what, uh, what, how are they related. This is like incredibly powerful because you know, without, without a feature like this, you effectively have to go and inspect every bit of job code to understand where is data coming from and where is data going. So super cool stuff. If he's going to talk quite a bit more on, on uh, lineage later. Uh, what I will also point out with volumes that's extremely powerful is that it can be accessed by POSIX commands. So for me, I'm a Linux junkie, so this is like, you know, my dream come true. I can just do an ls on volume slash volume123 and read data out of my volume directly. You also have the ability to continue to use dbutils fsls to access the volume data, but the fact that you can do it via a POSIX command is super powerful in and of itself. <clears throat> so all of this together, volumes, tables, right? Managed versus external. Tables can be managed. Tables can be external tables, right? Volumes can be managed. Volumes can be external. It all depends on how you choose to, to uh, define them, and uh, effectively with a volume, if I create a volume and it uses a managed location, right, like a managed data source, that volume's path is managed by Unity Catalog, this may be completely okay, right? You may want to do this. For example, if I'm giving like a particular user access to a file system and I don't care where they write their data, I just want them to have a you know, well-governed siloed space for them to operate, I might choose to do this. It simplifies you know, path management for me. If, for example, I have a web app right, that is producing a bunch of, or, a, or like an iOS app that's producing a bunch of uh, information output data and it's landing it in a particular S3 bucket, I don't want to go change that, that code. That's going to be a nightmare, right? Um, I want to just register that particular path as a volume so that I can create my pipelines and my jobs directly on it. So, Super easy to work with file-based data sources in Unity. I, I believe like, this is, like, in my opinion, one of the simplest abstractions we could have come up with. I'm very proud of this feature. 
All right, so let's shift gears. We've talked a little bit about uh, registering your data. I want to talk a little bit now about securing your data. So just to level set this, right? With Unity, all of your metadata is in one place, right? You have a metadata layer across your file sources. You have a metadata layer across your database sources. And ultimately, this gives you the ability to superpower your governance. Without Unity Catalog, you had these different database, Databricks workspaces. You had all of these different uh, RDBMS systems that you, know, you had to go and govern individually. Right? You had to manage users on those, on those resources. You had to manage the meta store uh, in, in, in your Databricks workspace. You had to manage access controls in your, your database or in your workspace. But with Unity Catalog, all of that stuff lives in one place. Your foreign databases, your access controls, your user management capabilities, your meta store. Set it once and keep going. So, Let's talk a little bit about how uh, and what is available with the Unity Catalog from an access control perspective, if you remember the, the previous slide that I had where I showed kind of all of the features. So from an access control perspective, Unity gives you the ability to centrally grant and manage those access permissions across workloads and foreign databases, as I've mentioned before. And if you've ever been a database admin or have uh, had to work with databases before, you're likely familiar with DCL, ANSI SQL DCL, which is a data control language specification part of ANSI SQL. Extremely straightforward. You grant a permission scope to a securable object, uh, on a securable object, to a group or a principal. Very easy to use. Very familiar. Don't want to reinvent the wheel, especially if it's a good wheel. We also have the ability to do this via UI. And we'll talk about it in a, in a couple of slides forward, but also the ability to do it via APIs and Terraform. This gets super powerful. Now, for more advanced use cases, you might want to take advantage of things like role-level security or column-level masking. Now, this gives you the ability to provide differential. And when I say differential, what I mean is I can have one access policy for the same table that IFI has a different access policy for uh, to these you know, file-based data sets or foreign tables that might live in different external databases. Now, for example, on the left-hand side, I might want to only show specific rows. So what would I do? I would create a filter. It's a function, and functions are cool because you can test them, right? Um, I would create a function that can basically test for group membership. And based on the presence of a particular group membership, I can choose to assign a filter predicate. So in this example, if I'm a member of the group admin, I'll see everything. If I'm not a member of the group admin, then I will have this predicate region is equal to US forced on me for wherever this function is applied. And in this case, this function is applied on this particular table. So when I query it, all I'll see is data, if I'm not a member of the admin group, is data that fits that predicate. So as you can, as you can start to imagine, this can become very powerful very quickly. And this also works with, uh, uh, obviously, multiple use cases. So if I want to do multiple if checks, I can you know, build any like, level of complicated uh, expression that I, I choose to desire. The same thing works for column masks, right? So masking or redacting sensitive columns. For those of you that worked in, work in regulated industries, obviously, this is very important to you. You want to ensure that certain user profiles and roles only have access to be able to see certain data or some part of the data. Um, this is possible with column level masking. And it works very similarly to how role level security works. I create a function. That function tests for group membership. Right? I can assign uh, that function to a, to a column. Uh, and in that function, right, if my group membership test fails, I can optionally choose to provide you know, like a literal value back. I can optionally choose to, to perhaps run a function on the original value, say, for example, an ND5 hash or an encryption uh, uh, call to like, you know, one-way or two-way encrypt the data. So there's lots of power and, and capability there uh, in terms of what you can do with role-level security and column-level masking. This is just the beginning. It gets cooler. So we recently added a feature called uh, Workspace Catalog Isolation. So this gives you the ability to effectively ensure that you can access data from specified environments only. So I'm actually going to flip a couple of slides back so I can tell this story a little bit better. If you remember, all of your metadata is in one place across your organization, right? So without Unity Catalog, you kind of had these implicit domain boundaries, right? Uh, workspaces were kind of that implicit domain and operational boundary. With Unity Catalog, again, it's all in one place, right? So what about that? So this is why we added some isolation primitives to be able to allow you to dictate where your data can be accessed from. Now, a simplistic example is I'm a dev user, right? I want to access dev data. But I have to do this through my dev workspace. So a dev uh, user will access dev data through their dev workspace. I can, I can effectively say that dev data is only available in dev in the dev workspace. I could say that staging data is only available in dev and maybe also in staging, right? Because the testers need to get access to it too. But those testers also need to see data that's in production, right? So the tester would have access to staging data and production data in their, in, uh, on their, uh, uh, their, their user profile or their group profiles. However, as a tester, I don't want to see that production data in staging. I might you know, do something that I'm not supposed to do or see something that I'm not supposed to see. I only want to see it when I'm in a production environment. This is where uh, workspace catalog isolation comes in handy. In short, the access to data and the availability of data, like you won't even see it in your data explorer, 
can be isolated across those workspaces and then further into groups. All right, so I, I'd love to talk about this because this is near and dear to me because I love to do more with less, right? So high leverage governance is all about, uh, uh, you know, kind of move a little like lever and you get like a gr great and gigantic output, right? That's, that's the, the reality of, of what high leverage means. And you can use patterns like data sec ops or policies as code to kind of scale your efforts with Unity Catalog. So specifically, privileges for UC objects can be managed programmatically using our Terraform provider. This is especially great for teams that are already using Terraform. If you're not, you should check it out. Uh, and it'll also pair naturally with the management of UC objects, specifically things like the Metastore, uh, catalogs, assignments, so on and so forth. Extremely simple to use. We have some amazing blog posts about it and uh, a wonderful team that is working on uh, our Terraform APIs, uh, ter our Terraform modules, and it's, it's like phenomenal. It's definitely better than it was a couple of years ago. It's very easy to articulate this to create these like, CI CD pipelines that make it easy for you to kind of be very particular about how you are establishing permissions or access across your data estate. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, discovery and search and lineage, and I'm going to hand that over to Ify. Thank you, Ify. Thanks, Lishan. OK, so first, let's talk about lineage. Why are we spending so much time and engineering and effort to build lineage features? Because it can be extremely powerful. From a compliance perspective, right, it can help you answer questions like, what data produced this model? How do we get that output? What was the source? It can help you figure out, OK, I have a sensitive table. Where has data potentially gone from it? Um, analysts can now trust the data better because they know where it originated from. You can also uh, track down issues, right? If there's an issue in my data quality, I can track down where it may have originated from. Or if I'm making a change to my bronze schema, for example, I can figure out what are the downstream consumers that will be affected by that and plan for it. So lineage is extremely powerful, great productivity booster, and the great thing about Unity Catalog that it gets collected automatically. So all you need to do is basically start using Unity Catalog, registering your data in it, running your compute against the Unity Catalog registered data, and the lineage will be collected. And it's not just for tables. So we collect lineage from tables, for columns, for dashboards, workflows, notebooks, files. Basically, the goal is to have full coverage of the lake house, right? And we're getting very close to that. So embrace Unity Catalog so you get all these powerful lineage features. When it comes to discovery, also search is very important. So we now have an integrated user interface where we can search across your lake house. All the personas have the same experience. The Unity Catalog permissions are respected. So for example, if you don't have access to a sensitive table, you're not going to find it with your search. And again, the search is not just across tables, but it's across all sorts of data assets, your notebooks, your jobs, your queries, um, your repos, your files, everything across your lake house. What's important for discovery to be really powerful in your organization is for you to establish best practices when it comes to tagging and commenting on your data and your pipelines. So tag your data on the ingestion so that it's properly um, tagged throughout, and people can search for it and leverage it. Very important. And by the way, if you embrace Lakehouse in, the, in Unity Catalog, in the future, as you saw in the demo yesterday in the keynote, you also get a lot of better search and discovery capabilities with Lakehouse IQ in the future. So you see in Lineage, super powerful in discovery. Now, auditing your data. Another great thing that Unity Catalog enables is better visibility into your, um, your audit. We have now system tables, which means basically we have taken the logs that are produced from your workspaces, the operational data and everything, we're, we're crunching it and we're presenting it to you in simple delta tables so that you can run some simple SQL queries against it and be able to answer questions about your metadata, about usage, about access, billing, cost, all sorts of very insightful questions. For example, who last updated this specific table and when? Uh, who has access to this data asset? Who deleted this data asset? What did this particular user access in the last 24 hours? Things around billing. What has been my pattern of usage in the last month or two? Um, what are the top consumers in terms of users, in terms of jobs? 
Now you can answer all that with simple SQL queries. And then lineage as well. There's the, the UI, the graph, but there's also simple SQL now. So you can ans ask questions like, what are the queries that are feeding in from this specific table? So very, very powerful insights. Again, through system tables with simple SQL queries. And now let's talk a little bit about data sharing, which is also a very, very important concept related to UC. Data sharing is very powerful because it can help accelerate innovation in your company and it can help you open new business practices. And in Databricks, that's powered by the open source um, project of Delta sharing. We'll talk a little bit about it. We have our Databricks marketplace that is an open marketplace for your data and AI and applications, not just data. And then Databricks Clean Rooms provides privacy safe computing and collaboration among companies, uh, between companies, without data duplication, and can go across regions, across clouds as well. Now, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar how, what momentum Delta sharing has had in the last two years that it's been around. Uh, so we introduced it two years ago, it went GA about a year ago, and there has been over 300 petabytes of data that has been shared through Delta sharing. And it's very widely um, adopted. Oracle has embraced it for their autonomous database. Dell is working with us on um, cross-cloud platform uh, applications, analytical applications. Cloudflare R2 is adding support for it very soon. So great momentum. And the two reasons, the, the two you know, key things that Delta sharing brings is one, it's not just tables. You know, we've had ways to share files before and, and tables, but now we can share all sorts of data assets. We can share views, files, models, um, notebooks, right? Like a whole package of a data product. And it's also not limited to Databricks. We are, it's an open framework, right? We embrace open source. We, we want to expand the community. And so you can be a Databricks client or you can be a simple Python client, or you can just access a share from your Power BI, or even just from Microsoft Excel, if that's the tool that you like to use. So very powerful. And that's what, fee what powers our Databricks marketplace as well, right? So we build a Databricks marketplace so that there's one place, it's open for everybody for, again, data, analytics, and AI. So not just data sets, but also notebooks, dashboards that come along, ML models that have been trained on the data so that you can really be productive um, with, uh, with those uh, data sets. And again, the, the, the power of all this is that you can innovate faster, you can access data assets that you didn't have you know, easy access to before, and you can create new revenue streams for your company by monetizing your data products. All right, now I'll pass it back to Zishan to talk to us about upgrades. Awesome. Thank you, Ify. So just to recap, one of the things that Ify uh, uh, said, right, is that Unity Catalog powers Delta sharing. So all that cool stuff you saw, you get it for free if you use Unity Catalog. So let's talk about uh, what it takes to uh, upgrade to Unity Catalog. So this slide is kind of intended to scare you a little bit, um, and, and it's kind of a joke because it's actually a little bit easier than it looks. Um, so if we, if we think about like, the steps that are involved, like let's take the left-hand side. It's important to design what your, your uh, Unity catalog will look like. You'll want to understand, uh, how am I going to organize my catalogs? How many workspaces do I need? How am I going to get account groups from my identity provider into Unity catalog? Uh, what are, uh, who are going to be you know, assigned to the default roles that are in the product? Once you've done all that stuff and you've kind of you know, planned out how you want to use the product, you do a one-time setup. You create a meta store. Uh, you skim your identities from Azure Active Directory, Okta, OneTrust into uh, Databricks, into Unity Catalog. And then you join those uh, workspaces that you want to start using Unity Catalog with to that meta store. <clears throat> Once you've done that, then you can create all of the objects that we talked about, things like storage credentials, external locations. You can create catalogs. You can set the default owners uh, for things. Once that's done, then you go through the process of upgrading your legacy metadata. So we have a command, and I'll walk through it um, extensively in the next couple of slides, called sync, that allows you to sync external tables and, and manage tables to Unity Catalog. Um, you then grant access on things like catalogs, schemas, tables, and files. And later on down the path, you can consider upgrading your workloads so that your workloads are writing directly into Unity Catalog instead of into Hive. 
finally, at the end, you can decommission the old pipelines, the old clusters, your mounts. No longer have to use Hive. It's beautiful. Now, there is an easy button here, right? And that easy button is that you can keep your jobs and you can bring your readers, right? So your jobs, the entirety of job code that you have, all of the tables that are currently registered in Hive, you can continue to keep them running there for some period of time. And you can actually use our sync command to synchronize the metadata from Hive directly into Unity Catalog. Now, within Unity, you get the best of governance, right? Your readers can access data in a governed way. Anything that you create that's new can access data in a governed way. This is the easy button, right? In the long run, you might want to consider upgrading those jobs because you want to get things like job lineage uh, into the product so you can take advantage of all the cool things that Ify pointed out. But if you want to start using the product right away, this is about the fastest way to do it. Now, a little bit more on that sync command. You have the ability to upgrade both managed and external tables. And you can run this command multiple times, item potently. Uh, and you would use it to pull any changes, any metadata schema changes that occurred in Hive or Glue uh, into Unity over time. So you would use a job for long-term synchronization. So if you go through the process that I showed earlier, you kind of you know, do a one-time initial migration. You set up a job for all the assets that are not in Unity Catalog or uh, 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 you know, default, like the jobs are creating them in Unity Catalog. And you know, that's it. You're there. You can now get the best of both worlds. You don't have to worry about making significant changes, and you can start using governance right away. Definitely works. Uh, you also should consider using the dry run option to test the sync uh, before you make any changes to the target table. And it's important to understand that this, uh, for the managed tables, this actually works on Hive managed tables where you have schema locations defined. So for example, if I did an ultra schema set location or I created a schema with a specific location in Hive, it points to some external path, then I'm able to use the sync command or our upgrade wizards to basically upgrade these easily and, and simply in the product. Now, the not pretty part is when I have a managed table that lives in DBFS root. Now, hopefully your Databricks uh, essays or your account team were very clear about saying don't store data in root, in DBFS root, because it's an uncontrolled file system. I hope they told you that. But if they didn't tell you or you didn't listen, um, then there's a path forward, right? So if it's, a, if it's a managed delta table and you want to take it to a managed delta table in Unity Catalog, you can do something very simple. It's a create table with a clone. Very easy to do. If it's a managed non-delta table, you can register it as an external non-delta table in Unity Catalog by using a create table with a location qualifier. Very simple. And once you're done, you just drop the old table because guess what? You've moved the data, right? This requires you to actually move the data. This is the uncomfortable place, but it's only if you've been storing data in DBFS root. If you've not been storing data in DBFS root and you're a good Databricks uh, user, right, then chances are you won't have to go through this pain. All right, so let's talk a little bit about architectural patterns. Um, the first thing I want to touch on is a multi-region, multi-cloud topology. And if you remember Ify's comments from earlier, right, we've moved a lot of data with Delta sharing, uh, and this is one of the reasons why, right, because we, we actually use Delta sharing within our product to uh, stitch together multiple regions and multiple clouds. So if I've got an enterprise uh, organization, for example, that's operating in, let's just say for, for simplicity's sake, three regions, right? Maybe it's east, central, and west in the US, right? Um, it's hard, right, and costly to kind of move data across regions, right? You have to pay things like egress costs. So you want to be very particular about what data you're querying from west that lives in east and what data you're querying from central that lives in west and so on and so forth. It's important to understand that metastore boundaries, right, are the region in the cloud. And this is obviously due to things like latency, cost, physics, practical sense. Um, it's important to have a single region metastore for things like SDLC scopes and, and business units that we've talked about earlier, right? We talked about how do I separate my metastore out with catalogs and isolation. It's all powerful. It's all, it's all powered by Unity Catalog, right? We have the ability to leverage the workspace catalog binding feature as needed. Um, and then for the data that needs to be made available across regions, you can create delta shares. You can very easily make that data available in a secondary region. And uh, you know, or a possibly a, a different cloud provider. So it's a very easy, very simple topology powered by Delta sharing. All right, so we talked and touched on this in a, in, in a way like earlier. So one of the reasons that we have, you know, different workspaces uh, for Dev and Prod is the same reason that we have different environments for Dev and Prod anywhere else, right? Uh, we want things to reside with physically different uh, security um, on either side, perhaps different VNets, different VPCs, different classes of compute. This is sort of independent of Unity Catalog, but it kind of like leads you to this like pattern that we see here. And this is a simplistic version of that pattern, right? Dev and Prod. Um, and this is not dissimilar from some of the patterns that we looked at with workspace catalog isolation. I have a catalog, a dev catalog, or some number of dev catalogs that I would bind to a dev workspace, right? And that dev data, the external locations, the 
uh, you know, underlying storage abstractions in my cloud would be available for that workspace and that workspace only because, you know, VPC bound or VNet bound. And then the same thing could occur for prod. So basically, this gives me the best of both worlds. I can have the logical isolation to not have a cluttered looking catalog when I look at things in dev or when I look at things in prod. And <clears throat> I, can, I can make some guarantees in terms of uh, network access for the underlying storage devices. So, so definitely something we recommend. It's very simple to set up. Um, and uh, excited to hear stories from all of you guys in the future about how this is working for you. So with clusters and endpoints, uh, I want to land the first point, right? For warehouses, I need SQL Warehouse. It pretty much works with Unity Catalog out of the box. Once you upgrade your workspace to Unity Catalog, you assign a Metastore, your warehouse can query data that's, that's registered in Unity Catalog. For clusters, it's a little bit more uh, nuanced. So for standard clusters that use what we call single user mode, this is kind of intended for Scala users, data scientists, ML runtime, ML flow, et cetera. Um, what that means is that effectively the, the user of the single user cluster is the only user that can execute code on that cluster. So for example, like notebook collaboration, the, your, your coworkers, your other users would be able to see the things that are appear in your notebook, but they cannot actually execute code. Now there are some limitations that are good to understand with standard clusters. Specifically, access to views, access to fine-grained access control is not supported in single user clusters. There's a very good reason for this. In a single user cluster, you're effectively root, right? So the best I can give you is object level access control. For fine-grained access control, you would use what's called standard clusters with user isolation mode. User isolation mode applies for pretty much every other workload, right? So ETL data exploration allows you to use things like SQL and Python. Multiple users can use the same cluster. We are in the process now of bringing in ML runtime uh, features and ML flow support into shared clusters. But at the present moment, your data scientists say they want to, you know, create some features, do some table prep, uh, build, build their, their, their data sets for training. They would do that in a shared cluster so that they can access all the data that they need to, to, to uh, access. They'd build their feature tables, and then they would train them on standard clusters in single user mode to take advantage of MLflow and ML runtime. All right, I think uh, it's time to actually see some stuff, and maybe I can finally stop talking, right, Ify? There you go. Thanks, Ishan. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's stretch a little bit while we switch gears here. Make sure things work, great. Okay, so we're gonna look at a demo and look at some of the things that we were just talking about. Thanks. In the scenario that we have here, we are a, a high-tech company. We produce uh, software applications. Our customers you know, use them online, log in. We collect logs from them. So in our scenario, we're just gonna be processing some access logs from our applications and um, we'll see how our different users will benefit from Unity Catalog. First, we have John, he's our data engineer. He's the one that has created and manages the pipeline that brings in the access logs uh, to the cloud and then does the bronze, silver, gold and prepares the data for the analysts. So John is really excited about Unity Catalog because he, whenever he makes a change to the pipeline, you know, people are yelling at him, he wants to be able to easily know who's gonna be effective, give them a heads up, have good visibility as to what's going on with the pipeline, who's using it. So he really likes the lineage capabilities. Alice is our BI analyst. Um, she uses the gold data and has her dashboards and that's the analytics. Alice really wants to have a holistic view of data across the organization. So there has been some shadow IT going on in the organization. I'm sure people are familiar <laughs> with that scenario. Um, there's a group, for example, that decided to use Snowflake, so, uh, you know, she doesn't want to argue with them, but she just wants to have a holistic view of the data, right? And we'll see how she can leverage Unity Catalog and Federation to accomplish that. Then we have Emily. Emily is our unified governance and security person. She cares about protecting the data. She wants to make sure that the PII data is secure. She wants to make sure that she's complying with GDPR and other regulations that exist. And so we'll see how role level and column level security help her achieve her goals. And last, we have Mark. Mark is the platform owner. He just wants to have good visibility into what's going on with the platform. So he's excited about system tables because now he can very easily understand who's using what, um, what are the cost projections, and things like that. Okay, so let's switch to our workspace. And this is now a workspace that has been um, connected to Unity Catalog, but data and applications and pipelines haven't been upgraded yet. I happen to be a Metastore admin, which is why when I hover here, 
I can see the meta store that I'm connected to, right? And that indicates we are in Unity Catalog. And so now we're gonna look at the data that we're gonna be working with. It is legacy data, it's in the Hive meta store. We have our schema and we have our bronze, silver, gold data. We'll take a quick look at the, um, at the gold data, just so you have a sense of what we're working with. So we have the users that log into our applications, we have their email, the IP address that they logged in from, what time, through what platform, and uh, country. So that's the data set that we're working with. Now, um, our analyst, Alice, has a dashboard built on top of this gold data. And uh, she's doing some aggregates here, some analytics. This is a real-time uh, pipeline that's bringing in streaming data in, and this dashboard is refreshed um, every minute or so. And so you'll see the, the total count of data rows that we're processing um, increase over time. So the first thing we want to do, um, we said our data engineer would like to upgrade the pipeline to get some uh, benefits from Unity Catalog. As Zisha mentioned, the easy button, the way to start, is to upgrade your readers, right? So leave your pipeline alone for, for now. Let's upgrade our readers so that at least we can start having some better fine-grained security. And so the first thing we need to do is sync our Hive tables with Unity Catalog. So I have a... Um, Simple notebook here with the sync command ready to go. And let's run those three right here. I have the wrong cluster. Okay, UC sync cluster, there we go. Let's run it again. And so first thing we do is a dry run just to, to make sure that you know the sync will happen and there won't be any issues. Um, we see the dry run is success. If there has been any problem, um, if there's something missing, there will be some direction here as to what might be missing so that the sync can work. And once the dry run is successful, we can actually perform the actual sync. Now, again, what that does is that it syncs the metadata from Hive to Unity Catalog. And in our case, we've selected to sync basically our UC deep dive schema in Hive with a UC deep dive schema in the main catalog. So now we can query the data. I'm doing a select star for main now, UC deep dive login data gold. And we can see the same data. So we have successfully synced the metadata. What we need to do next is update our dashboard, our queries that we're going against Hive. We want them to go now against Unity catalog. So back to the dashboard that uh, Alice is looking at. If I look at the query that is feeding this dashboard, right now it's selecting data from Hive Metastore. So all we're gonna do is change this to main. We're gonna save this query and we're going to rerun it. And now the data is still being queried. The metadata is going through Unity Catalog. Um, so we have upgraded our reader successfully. If we go back to our dashboard, we can refresh it. It's gonna pull now the data, the metadata from UC, and again, the same data. Our counter keeps going up. So we have successfully updated our readers to use Unity Catalog. And now we can even do you know, fine-grained controls and things that UC allows us to do on this data. But we don't wanna stay there, right? So our data engineer really wants the lineage capability. So we're gonna upgrade our pipeline as well to UC. And this is the pipeline that's feeding this data. We have a job running, it's a streaming job. It has been running here for a while now. So let's take a quick look at what this job is doing. First of all, it's reading data from a DBFS mount point, right? That's how we set this up a couple of years ago when we set up this pipeline. Um, we now know that DBFS is not the best thing to use, so we're gonna upgrade that to volumes. And it's writing to Hive Metastore. We're gonna change it as well. We're gonna write instead to the main catalog. Uh, what the actual uh, code is doing, we're using autoloader to read in CSV files from the object store put it in a bronze schema, a bronze table, I'm sorry. 
Then bronze to silver is some parsing of timestamps, a little bit transformation going on there. And then from silver to gold, a little bit more cleanup in our data. So simple three-level pipeline, um, it's all happening in streaming right now. The first thing we need to address is that DBFS mount point, right, where we're actually reading the data from. So we're gonna go back to our notebook here, and we're gonna create a volume on top of that raw location in our storage account. Create external volume, we're gonna run this command, we're gonna describe it, and then list it. So by creating a volume now on top of our raw data folder, we have added a, a security layer, basically, and we have also made it a POSIX file system relatable um, uh, folder. So now we can do simple things like ls in the volume, and we can go put uh, privileges like grant, you know, who can read, who can write on it. Things that we couldn't do with the DBFS mount before. Excellent, so let's go back to our code, and now we're gonna edit our code and change that um, raw path from DBFS mount to volume, and we're gonna change the output going to main versus Hive Metastore. Now, ideally, you have parameterized your code, right? So this is easy to do. You change your parameters. If you haven't, it will be a little bit extra work, um, but it's a good best practice to adopt for the future. All right, so we changed the code. Let's go back to the job. Now what we have to do is restart the job so it picks up the new uh, changes in our code. And we also have to change the cluster that we use. If you have legacy ETL jobs, they're probably using clusters that are not UC enabled. Um, so you will need to create clusters with later runtime, 10.4 or above, or, but you know, if you use 13, like the latest, obviously you get more features. So we're gonna change our cluster to a UC enabled one. It's running 13.1 right now. Okay, and we're gonna restart our job. So we've changed from DBFS mount to volumes, we've changed from writing out to Hive to now writing out to the main catalog. We're restarting the job. We see the new parameters picked up here. And now our streaming pipeline is continuing from where it left off, but now using Unity catalog metadata. So now if I go back to um, my data explorer, because we have this job running in Unity, with Unity catalog tables now, we also have built automatically the lineage between the data. So let's explore the main catalog, UC Deep Dive Schema, and let's look now at our gold table within the Unity catalog. So first off, we have the fine-grained permissions we can define on it, right? So we can select who has, we can specify who has select, who has write on it, and we now have a lineage created for us as well. If we look at the lineage graph, we can see the gold table has originated from the silver table. If we expand the lineage, we see that silver originated from bronze. And we can even go all the way to the file system, to the object store, and see that the bronze table actually originated from this raw volume. So this happened literally by just upgrading the pipeline. We now have the lineage, and now um, our data engineer knows, okay, if I change something in this bronze table, I'm gonna affect this silver and gold as well. And not only tables. We can actually see which workflow is related from a lineage perspective to this table. We can also see what dashboard feeds it from it, and you know, queries, pipelines, and so on. Excellent, so now let's take a look at Alice again, right? She wanted to see that holistic view of what's going on in her organization. And so we're gonna take a quick look at how she's doing that. Now we can create a connection and connect to Snowflake. We can create a foreign catalog that brings in the data from Snowflake. And we can query now through Unity Catalog our Snowflake tables. So this is how Query Federation works in UC. Okay, so again, one layer of metadata. And now let's go and change, for example, our query 
and say, okay, well, now my dashboard will show me data from the gold table as well as my snowflake table. So I created a holistic view of my data across my organization. Let's see the quicker executing, and here's my data. Okay, so that's wonderful. We have that holistic view. Now, let's go to Emily. We said Emily really cares about uh, PII data, right? Uh, uh, governance, um, uh, GDPR, right? All sorts of regulations. So we'll see how she can leverage role level filtering and column level masking to accomplish uh, those goals. So we are going to create two functions one for filtering the country, one for filtering or for masking email. Basically, the rules are very simple that we set here. We say, uh, if you belong to the HR group, then you can see everything. Otherwise, you're only gonna see country USA, um, or you're gonna see the word redacted as, uh, instead of the actual email. So the filter country, the mask email. And so now we're going to um, create those two functions. So let's select them, run them. And they get registered within, by the way, the schema, so you can apply also uh, permissions to those. And now we're gonna alter our tables and apply, um, let me run this, and apply the functions on our Snowflake table and our gold table. So this is pretty powerful. Like you can have a single place in the unit catalog where you're defining security policies and apply them across the different catalogs that, uh, that report up to um, Unity Catalog. So uh, let me change the catalog here and rerun this. There we go. So now, querying that Snowflake table again, now we can see the email being redacted. We can see the country filtered out just for USA. I think this is pretty, pretty amazing, right? So single place, you manage all your permissions, all your um, functions, and now you can apply it across all the different catalogs registered in UC. Uh, okay, so that was Emily, and last, let's look at Mark. Mark really cares about what's going on in the platform. He wants to see good auditing. He wants to see now, use the system tables to be able to answer questions around billing, usage, and so on. So here's a simple query that Mark can run against, for example, the system operational data billing logs and be able to see what was the consumption uh, for the last you know, month or so. He can also see what kind of SKUs are being used. There's a lot of all-purpose compute, a lot of development going on, it looks like. He can see who are the top consumers um, of the platform. And it looks like Pavan is his top consumer and maybe he wants to have a conversation with him. So that concludes our demo, right? And again, just to recap, we saw how the data engineer, John, used uh, Unity Catalog to be able to have good lineage across his pipeline, see what are the downstream consumers. Alice used federation within Unity Catalog to be able to create that holistic view of data in her organization. Emily used role level and column level security to be able to protect her PII and comply with regulation. And then Mark used system tables to quickly understand how the platform is used and answer simple questions around usage and billing. So thank you for uh, watching the demo. And next up, I want to invite our guest speaker here, uh, Bosco from Privacera, who's going to tell us how they're extending the capabilities of Unity Catalog. Thank Thanks. you. I know it's lunchtime. We'll try to keep it quick. Uh, I'm Don Bosco Durai. I'm the co-founder and CTO for Privacera. I'm also the creator of um, Apache Ranger. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about two topics. One is extending Unity Catalog to address some of the complex uh, uh, compliance requirements in enterprises. And the second is going to be an interesting topic where we're going to be using Athena Federation to query Unity Catalog and make sure that the same policies that are in Unity Catalog are applied in, uh, in, in Federation also. Um, well, those who don't know about Privacera, we do centralized uh, data access governance um, for most uh, large customers. And if you see our messaging and Unity Catalog message is going to be identical. The reason is uh, we are trying to solve the same problem. Uh, the main difference is we are doing from two different sides. 
uh, Unity Catalog provides the foundation capabilities, uh, capabilities to set up, like, define policies at the lowest level and also enforce it. And what we are doing is we are simplifying it. So to take some examples in our customers, they have more than 40 terabyte workspaces. They are running Databricks SQL. They are running uh, legacy clusters with uh, interactive queries. They are doing jobs. And as they are moving into Unity Catalog, they are having multiple catalogs. They are having uh, multiple master stores, and also, in some cases, regions. Now, if you add more complication to it, that you have different personas. You have data engineering who has access to uh, multiple data sources. You have data owners who have access to their own data. Then you have data consumers like data analysts and data scientists who want to access some set of the data, but they have to be adhered to a lot of the compliance policies. So when you get add all of them, it just really gets very complex. So that is where we come into play. We have created apps and solutions on top of Unity Catalog, which can make it easier for enterprises to define policies and enforce it consistently across, across all data sources and data services. So we, have, we just announced our AI governance, um, but today I'm going to be mostly talking about the governed data stewardship. So the whole concept of governed data stewardship is to use data sets to manage policies rather than tables and individual resources. If you look at most enterprises, you have thousands of uh, uh, tables. When you get into this, managing this fine grain can be very really challenging. Right? So what we are doing is we are creating data sets which has resources from multiple data sources. And then you can set policies on those data sets. You can give access to users and groups and roles. And then these data sets are, have the fine grain authorization in build, like uh, rollover filter and data masking. And the, the, the GDS will automatically translate these policies into low level what uh, the native system understands. Right? So before uh, Unity Catalog, I mean in Databricks SQL and before fine grain access control. Um, if you had to do all those things, uh, you had to create secure views, and you had to go and manage policies at a very, very low level. With Unity Catalog, uh, one of the advantages we have is we can set an Unity Catalog, and Unity Catalog will translate that into all the local things. So this, even though this, we are doing it for ourselves, this probably applies for all of you guys also, right? One of the advantages of this is with Unity Catalog, it takes care of all the IAM roles and HTS tokens and all those things, which used to be a big problem for us. Now it's, this uh, solves us. And there are also a few other advantages. With this thing now, uh, you can also uh, have uh, self-service, and you can have uh, the data owners manage policy more efficiently. So uh, I'm going to be doing a, a small demo on this one. The, the second use case um, is about Athena. So let's assume. You right now we have high meta store and glue data catalog, and you are using both Databricks as well as Athena. Some of the users are using Athena console to run queries, and you're using Databricks uh, SQL for others. When you move into uh, Unity catalog, you're going to have some sort of a challenge around it. So that is where um, Databricks and we got together. We created Athena uh, connector. It's a federation uh, design where when you're running the query from Athena, the metadata comes from Athena. And also, when you're running the, uh, the data, also comes from, sorry, the, the metadata comes from Unity Catalog, and also data comes from Unity Catalog. And what we are doing is, as a private server, we're taking the policies in Unity Catalog and applying in, uh, in Athena. That means you get the same fine grain authorization whether you're accessing through Unity Catalog or Athena. So I'm going to show a quick demo after this. So, so um, at the top level, you have the customer domains, or the different domains, like business unit domains, your sales domain. The domains can have resources from multiple data sources. It could be Hive or Unity Catalog or anything else. Then, where you can have a, a, a subset of the data. So if you have multiple business units, you can put data from uh, different data sources into one of them. And then you have an owner for this. The reason for the owner is that the owner can create data sets and then start assigning policies. So, so data sets could be based on purpose, role, or any, any other reasons. And then within the data sets, uh, you can pull uh, resources from 
Unity Catalog, or Database SQL, or S3, and, and you can manage it from one place. <coughs> um, since they are all logical, the same resource can be in more than one data source. And once you create a data source, you can share. In this case, I have already shared with uh, Nigel and uh, Data Engineering. So if I go to Athena, if I run a query right now as a different user called Sally, uh, it will get denied because at this point, uh, Sally does not have permission. I'm going to run the same query in uh, Databricks SQL also using Unity Catalog. And at this point, even Unity Catalog does not have this permission. So, so this is the response from Athena where Sally does not have the permission. So she got denied. And then if you run the same query in um, uh, Unity Catalog, you'll get denied. So since uh, the table is in a given data set, I can go and easily give access to users or groups. I can also have a self-service. So I give access to Sally. I only going to give read. And so what is happening at this point is there are a lot of resources out here. And there are certain resources which have sensitive information, or there are policies like uh, um, data residency, data processing. So uh, in this particular use case, Sally has access to only US uh, 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 customers. So what we have done is we are actually pushing the policies into Unity Catalog, as, as, I, as you see, as it's going on. I'll show the, uh, how the audit goes through. So if you see the audit, um, what you have done is uh, all the grants and, uh, are done for all the resources out here. If you have multiple tables, all the, all the tables will go through. If you have data, database SQL, for every workspace also, we go and do the grant. Mm -hmm. Now if I go and run the same query in Athena, uh, you'll see that uh, Sally now has the permission. And another important thing out here is uh, she will not see data for other than US. And the same result will also show up in uh, Unity Catalog. So the identical result where she has access to only US data. And another good thing about is since uh, Unity Catalog provides us the audits, we pull all the audits from Unity Catalog and we show in one place. So whether it's in Databricks SQL workspaces or it's in Unity Catalog, it comes in, you can see both the allowed and denied audits. So, so, so pretty much that's it from my side. I'll give it back to you. Thanks.